Okay. Now I'm going to get this started. Um, who was the people who were here yesterday? They likely remember. I don't want to fall down. <laughs> they likely remember that I tend to have the ability to surprise people, but also to draw people into the city. So, how many of you remember the Lock for Shell incident? How many of you had a lovely Christmas during the Lock for Shell incident? <laughs> so, when my colleagues went through that uh, remediation, I thought about, well, Maybe we are not the only ones, but at least my colleagues could make use of a bit more education about security, about dependency management, about S-bombs, and about learning where dependencies come from, like we heard yesterday right on that stage. So my first reaction to that was to reach out to Thomas. Hi, can you help us? And Thomas came back to me saying, well, you're not the only one having that kind of challenge. And that's when we got started discussing security and open source and free software and free software and open source in professional settings and what the challenges there are. And I thought like, okay, there's this tiny security track here at FOSS Backstage. Maybe we can blow that up a little bit. So I got ahead and called, where's Paul? Paul from Blaine Schwartz. There are people right over there. You likely remember me writing in funny email, like, I have that idea to do something about it, to do something public about it, to have a conference on that. And that is the invitation that I would like to share with you that we will have, I think we should have a slide back there behind us. What we want to do is a FOSS security campus in autumn in Berlin focused solely on the topic of security in relation to open source covering many topics, covering A, what can projects do, but also like we heard yesterday from the Agrifax incidents, and I've, I have a background at the Apache Software Foundation, so I remember the Agrifax thingy, also talking about what companies can do in order to manage their dependencies better and what they will have to watch out for. So handing it over. Yeah, so actually, we, had, we started with the idea on the rooftop of Berlin Buzzwords and then uh, two years ago, I think, we had this uh, talk here in these rooms about this idea and now um, it's evolving in a way uh, that everybody is now talking about supply chain security. I'm doing uh, Kubernetes in critical infrastructure, so this is a, it is a big topic and if we look into it, um, nobody is really um, expecting what's, what's coming. So the developers are overwhelmed with new frameworks, new code all the day, and we cannot expect that every developer is able uh, to know the full implications if they change something or if they add a new framework. We have this dependency health, we have now dependency graphs, and we have uh, political implications because some of the intelligence services want to use this uh, vulnerabilities uh, to spy on other people. And uh, this is something where we have a technical impact. We don't even have a well-known architecture of what is a secure uh, software, what is what, what do we need to build software securely? And, and, and in the last project I counted, because I just copied this, um, the DevSecOps uh, cycle from, from uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, 14 steps and all. I don't even know an organization which is able to build software according to these 14 security steps. And there might even be more. So we have political implications, we have technical ar architectural implications, Block for JShell was actually a bug from the 90s, so the Blu-ray recorders needed GNDI to download additional software, and somehow this made it into Lock 4 j and nobody noticed until a Black Hat talk was about this, and then nobody understood it. What he's talking about, uh, yeah, this is, this is a vulnerability. We have to track this, we have to be aware of it. We have now um, every, uh, 
every project can easily create an S bomb if it is complete or if uh, perfect is, is another question. But uh, the S bomb is also responsible for tracking security vulnerabilities. So we have now a lot of more measures to build software securely and track vulnerabilities. So we should use it to build more secure systems and yeah, make all our life better because what we also very often see security is used to shock people. If you don't do this, this will fail terribly. And uh, this morning we learned that this is uh, not a good idea of promoting a new um, you know, new features. Security is not to scare people. Uh, we must be aware if we make our build systems, our software more secure, our life will get easier. This is the message we want to send. And you might have um, seen Gregor's talk, so I hand over to Gregor. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so one of the ideas pitched at this conference was that uh, given that I've been introduced by Isabel to being on this panel by being CC'd on an email that I will attend this panel, which is a very good method to draw people in. And uh, this has been kind of shaping my thinking about uh, what we could do is we could try to use standards to allow for automated, uh, for automated com uh, communications like we do in a lot of places. Um, the open source community has developed various ways to communicate between people who have never talked to each other. Because Git repositories are basically lines of numbers and letters and webhooks. And then we put those things next to them, we call licenses, and we kindly ask strangers we never met to please treat those, people might call it pieces of art we put on there, uh, in a certain way. And we just had a talk today about people talking about automating license compliance tools and analysis to actually respect the wishes of those contributing to open source. And um, I was wondering if we could use this idea and put an additional set of information into those pipelines. Like, how can you reach the people? And if you find a vulnerability with my code, please reach out to someone else because I'm doing this in my free time and I actually want to enjoy holidays with my children and not be called two days after Christmas because there's a look for j vulnerability in an open source repository of mine you used that I never sold you and now you're forcing me to help you with your operative system because it's actually used in a critical infrastructure which I also never asked you to do which is what happened to a friend of mine and then you can either go and try to fix your code used in a critical infrastructure or you can tell people that you will be on vacation and, well, he made the choice that most of us would and went to the critical infrastructure. Um, so we could automate those things. And I think that this is, in the spirit of this talk, when we talk about standing on the shoulders of giants, which makes it very bad for people who are actually afraid of heights, of heights like I am, um, then the next thing you think about is how to build your shoulders that others then can stand upon them and introducing what kind of documentation we want to send down the pipe um, might have been a way to have a worthwhile discussion to actually allow for reactions in case of security incidents. Well, when we talk about reacting to security incidents, I've been told that you have been doing quite, a, quite an amount of work on preventing them to happen. Right, Tara? Uh, yeah, so thank you. So I just found out one hour ago I'm going to be on this panel, um, but I was very excited too because uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the idea of that we should be, as an open source community, taking more of the lead in this security conversation. I've been, in the past couple of months, in lots of conversations about uh, things like supply chain security, bug bonds, and all of that. And some of them were like led by policy people, some of them were led by businesses. And I think like there's increasing sort of recognition of like, yeah, I mean, open source is being now increasing, increasingly reused and relied on. Uh, but yeah, sometimes it has bugs in it, like all code. So how do we deal with that? And I think, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, yeah, there is that argument, for example, that, yeah, I mean, code's provided without liability or that 
we're not your suppliers in a, in a way, in a traditional sort of supply chain, but whatever you want to call it, like dependency attacks are increasing. And I think f we should think responsibly about sort of like what code we're putting out there, how it's being used, how it's being, aff how that affects people and really start to um, yeah come up with maybe if we don't like the word supply chain and all of that, maybe we should come up with our own solutions that and use our own terminology that fits more our values as a community of free and open source software. Um, and yeah, for me personally, like I'm, uh, I'm a technologist. I work with the Sovereign Tech Fund, and recently we've we're currently working on our um, so, so, some. We do want to support more of this work. We're a maintenance fund. We're not a security fund, but lots of maintenance is security. So please, if you have any ideas about like uh, um, uh, technologies that need more help. Uh, making their security better or maintaining their security posture, please reach out to us. We will also soon announce uh, our bug bounty program, which we are calling the bug resilience program. Uh, and essentially the approach that we decided to take with our bug bounty is that instead of um, just announcing a bug bounty, we want to take a more preventative approach by uh, allowing the projects to go through a certain uh, like security posture improving phase before we start offering the bug bounty because then we want to eliminate the things that, for example, any known issues that might have, or for example, if they have, they know like there's a whole bunch of technical depth here or something that they want to refactor because they know that's going to be a problem for them. We want to give them a chance to solve these problems and work on them. And also, most importantly, they want, we want to have, we want to help smaller projects with their capacity on dealing with uh, vulnerability disclosure and to have that process and knowledge within their team so that when they're being approached with bug bounties, when with bug reports, they know how to deal with them. And once they go through these steps, uh, then we will start offering a bug bounty. And, because, and the idea is that we don't want to overwhelm projects with a, issues they know about or be overwhelm them with reports when they can't handle them or, or responsibly. Um, so yeah. That's, I guess that's uh, what I'll be working on in a couple of months. Yeah. So one funny story that I have to share in addition, and maybe you have some fun stories as well, is that I used to work at various companies, and one of those companies was looking for a security process. So they had like a product, and they needed a process for people to report security issues. And they were thinking for a very long time how to do that and how to shape that. And at some point in time, I get, went up to the team and asked them, like, have you ever looked at the security process of the Apache Software Foundation? And that one is fairly lightweight, but it has proven to work over m multiple doc decades. And what they did was to simply use that same process, adjust it a little bit, and to use it at their company. So these stories that I find interesting are also things where enterprises can learn from open source projects on how they can improve their processes. Do you have any other fun stories that you want to share? Uh, I, I think we can. Uh, we have a lot of good examples and also some bad examples. So if you, if you set the wrong incentives, then you are overwhelmed with um, useless uh, stories. But if you, uh, for example, if, if you have the right example, uh, in incentives, then you can report uh, bugs securely, but at the, mo at the moment in, in Germany we have a conflict that uh, you might be considered, according to this hacking paragraph, that you break things and then you get sued by, by lawyers. You report a security uh, bug and then um, you are thinking about, is this really worth this effort if you have, or personally I've seen one, when, print, uh, when company selling printers and they had uh, the return of the, um, the hardware, you, you could simply send a, a, a fill a form and then I saw, okay, it's just a number, it's counting and counting and counting. And then I went back and then I found the completely complete user base, but I never reported it because and this company was known that they would immediately send the lawyers and for the information you have uh, returned your printer cartouche. Um, this was not really an important um, uh, information, but we have lots of these examples. So normally if you work a lot with a software product, 
and look into it and look even deeper into it, it's highly probable that you found a security vulnerability. And then we have other teams like Zerforschung in, in Germany, so they spend whatever two hours on a Friday afternoon uh, finding a security vulnerability and then two days in the weekend by reporting them in the, in the right way to, to the uh, authorities. And this is well, something Gregor can talk about. Well, that, that's a project we're working on. We, um, I'm a part of the Innovation Council Public Health and the function of a board member for press and policy. And we build open source software to empower public health centers. We are a child of the pandemic. And we built infrastructure that allowed for contact tracing in 54 health centers in Northern Westphalia, Saxony, Hesha, and Turinga, serving 30 million people. And um, during rolling that out, we learned quite a bit of things about how to actually bring good solutions to people who work in the public administration. And we found one thing that was true, which is that there are good solutions out there. You just have to look around. We wish Germany would have done that before they went for the Register Modernisierungsgesetz, which will internally digitalize German's administration. And they didn't learn from Island or Ukraine, but they had their own ideas, which are broken beyond repair by architecture. And I feel like this is an interesting discussion to have had, is can we learn um, to speak about architecture being an IT security issue? Because we can write down formalized checklists like we do um, in Europe with the Cyber Resilience Act, and we can say they have an S-bomb, check. And we can show, see if they're license compliant, and we can see if they have a security TXT on their website. But if you build things in the wrong architecture, you can do whatever you want. You're never going to get that thing secure. And um, that would, I think, be a worthwhile discussion to be had because this also leads to the fact that security researchers sometimes have big problems getting through because they can argue that a certain infrastructure is going to be insecure, like if you allow for end-to-end -end encrypted communication between smartphones handed to the population and public health centers, input sanitation becomes kind of hard because it's like end-to-end -end encrypted. And um, then you can try to speak to people that, this is, a, that is, this is putting public health centers at risk, and no one will listen unless you actually uh, make yourself legally liable and take down a public health center, which then, again, no one does in the middle of a pandemic. So we would need to find a way to communicate those questions. And I think it would be great if someone actually would have an idea, because we're kind of out of cards. And there is a discussion of the European health data space coming up, which is currently the idea of putting the entire health data of the European population and put them in a federated database that everybody can access. We are not happy. So please, help. Um, yeah. I guess from my end, the story, I don't know why the story came to mind, like it was just, so lots of my job is also explaining to people why open source infrastructure is important, why it's important to continue to invest in the maintenance of open source software. So one of these times we're, we're trying to like write like sort of some sort of argument on like what's the actual like need, like how much funding is actually needed to fix all of open source. <laughs> and it's like that's obviously like such a big question, but we wanted like some a big like ballpark number and I think at some point I was just trying to like how we can best sort of convey that and just Googling things like how many bugs are there in Linux. <laughs> but then I actually like discovered um, actually an article that sort of like tries to estimate how much bugs in by David Wheeler from the OpenSSF uh, Linux Foundation. And for me, like it was a big aha moment because that's when I saw that he expressed sort of like not only bugs is like a function of lines of code, which I think like would be like my first sort of instinct, but it's also a function of time. So like, um, yeah, it's like bugs per thousand lines of code per, th per year. And for me, like that was for me like such an aha moment where, yeah, I can actually like, this for me is like something I can use to show people that like, yeah, I mean, obviously like the bugs don't just appear over time, like they're already there, but the more code exists and the more that it lives on, like code bases, 
yeah, people discover bugs. So that's why we need, we can't just invest now in security and say the software is now secure, just lock it like, and, and not spend any more like fun, funding to maintain it in the future. So uh, that's the sort of thing in my mind. So to, to conclude this um, mini panel, we will need your help in order to kickstart that conference. So please raise your hand if you know someone or if you can think of someone who has other funny stories to share or best practices to share. One, two, three. We also take problems that need to be solved. <laughs> Now we, all, we don't only need speakers, we also need attendees that listen to us. How many of you have people in your companies that should go to one of these conferences to learn more about how security and op open source works together? H how many of you can help us get at attendees? One, two, three, four, five. oh, that's many more. That's nice. <laughs> so I count on you. Um, there is a website over there where we will post updates and we are counting on you to help spread the word. Thank you for that. And with that, I think we are up for the closing session. Um,